Okay, folks, thank you so much for attending. We're going to go ahead and get started. We're a few minutes after, um, so uh, we're very excited to present Protocol Builder to you, one of the tools that's supported by the Clinical and Translational Science Institute here at Children's National. And before we begin the demonstration, we thought we might give you a little background into the Clinical and Translational Science Institute, or CTSI, here at Children's National. The CTSI is actually a uh, partnership uh, between the George Washington University and Children's National Health System, and we're actually funded by a very prestigious NIH Clinical and Translational Science Award grant. It's a multi-million dollar infrastructure grant that was awarded to us in 2010. And sorry, there one second. There we go. Um, and the purpose of the CTSA award is actually to help expedite research. So what the federal government discovered was that a lot of research is being conducted, a lot of research is being funded by the federal government, but it's not actually translating to effective change in medicine and healthcare. So they awarded this grant to 64 different hub institutions to help expedite that process to ensure that all of this investment that's being placed in research actually results in uh, changes within the healthcare system. Our CTSA is focused on five primary themes, the first being workforce development, the second collaboration and engagement, also integration, methods and processes, and informatics. And we actually achieved those themes uh, through the co collaboration of multiple different cores, and embedded in those cores are multiple modules, and they're developed to affect every aspect of research, from regulatory to uh, interacting with stakeholders within the community, to informatics and technology, which is where Protocol Builder falls in, to funding, so if you need help with finding vouchers or if you need help with funding your research, we help support and facilitate that, and also helping us connect with those other 63 hubs that are part of this uh, this effort. Um, I'm not going to go into all of them very deep, but what I will say is that you can find out more information on our website, which is www.ctsicn.org. And also, we facilitate all of these tools and resources that we offer through a system called Spark Request. So if you ever want to find out about a resource, visit our website. And if you're ready to register to use one or to request a service, you can visit our Spark Request. In addition to that, we have a series of navigators who help support all of these different modules and cores. And what they'll do is they'll actually walk you through step by step what you need to do in order to uh, register to use these tools and help you throughout the entire process. Anything that you need help with, we're here for you. In addition, if it's not something that we cover specifically, if it's something that's covered by another area of CRI, we're more than happy to work with you to help you find out how to access those resources as well. Uh, some of the resources that we offer are things such as voucher awards. So we do offer awards up to $10,000 per investigator per year to help support things such as coordinators and some of the other aspects of your research. We also have a number of informatics tools. So we do have Protocol Builder, which we're going to cover today. But we also have tools that will help you leverage the EHR system to help you with cohort feasibility um, and recruitment as well. We'll also help with REDCap and Open Clinica, so helping you with database support, as well as a number of other things. We also operate the Clinical Research Unit, so you've probably noticed us on the third floor. We have an area where you can conduct your research. There's space where you can do that. We also have Clinical Research Nursing support. We have Bio-Nutritionist support, Research Coordinator support. So if you need any of these things, feel free to reach out to us, and we're more than happy to help you. As I mentioned, we have our website, we have Spark, we have a dedicated email address to reach out to our navigators if you have any specific questions, and this is our website. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Neil Allen. He's part of the management team of Protocol Builder, and he'll walk us through the demonstration. Thank you, Jaren. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So uh, I'll go ahead and turn to the next slide. So uh, basically uh, today uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little about Protocol Builder. Protocol Builder is basically a, a tool, much like I would call it a TurboTax, for helping you create um, protocols that are clear, compliant, compliant, and complete. So I uh, hope that should be something you'll be looking forward to. Uh, again, myself, my name is Neil Allen. Uh, I'm the Director of Sales uh, for Protocol Builder. 
here is my contact information. Uh, feel free to uh, contact me at any time. Uh, Children's National has a subscription uh, to Protocol Builder, which is nicely paid for through the CTSI to support all of you guys. So basically, you all have free access to Protocol Builder and all its tools and all its support. Um, so we'll talk about how to make sure you know how to get signed up and how to leverage it and how to use the product. Uh, so that's what we're going to try and cover today. Um, Protocol Builder is actually from the Biomedical Research Alliance of New York. Uh, our acronym is Brainy. Kind of humorous, at least to me. Um, anybody here familiar with Brainy? Yay! Give that woman $100. Now, if you look under your seats, you'll all see keys to a brand new car. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, wrong show. Okay, um, so um, you might know actually Brainy through some of our uh, subsidiary companies. Uh, City Program, uh, which is the compliance training, is part of Brainy. Uh, HRP Consulting uh, is also part of Brainy. A lot, some, a lot of institutions use them. Brainy also happens to have its own independent IRB, uh, as well as IRB Consulting Services. And it was because of all this experience, you know, uh, basically, too, Brainy is, uh, is actually owned by these four nonprofits who originally got together to try and you know, help together make better tools and, and better services to service research administration needs. So they have a lot of experience in research administration and looking through, they were actually asked to research a problem, which was why are investigator-initiated trials basically moving so slowly through the system? And it turned out one of the biggest reasons was that protocols were basically being rejected and being sent back and having to go through many iterations. Have you guys ever had that problem? Yes, okay. So it's, it's not unique. Uh, and then we found this out to be pretty pretty general. So, um, you know, based on that, uh, they created Protocol Builder. And so, uh, you know, Children's National is one of the early adopters. Thank you very much. And hopefully giving you good value. But this is part of the value is we want to make sure that you guys really know and understand you know, what the tool is, how to use it, and how you get the most out of it. So that's why we're here today. So uh, I'm going to go over the, the basic functions of Protocol Builder. Um, we're going to go through all the basic functions, including, you know, how to get it into the IRB submission system. We know that's very, very important. You're going to be very excited to see that this product creates the standard work file, just the file exactly they need to be adopted in the IRB submission system with no problem. So one of the big views of Protocol Builder is you're not going to have to feel like, oh no, now I'm in this weird place. How am I going to finish this all up? Uh, you're going to find it's, it's very, very straightforward. And I hope you're also going to find, I'm sure a lot of you have some protocol templates either from your, your whole group or maybe within your subgroups that you've been using in Word. You're going, oh my God, I have all these great stuff I already did. I need this wording. You know, I don't want to walk away from that. You don't have to. We're going to show you how you can just take that, you have that vulnerable population, you know, text that has to be in every protocol. We'll show you you can put it in there and create, in essence, a template of your own based on Protocol Builder and saving yourself the work. So there's lots of ways the Protocol Builder can help you, and that's what we're hoping to show you today. And by the way, we call that, uh, we, we customize a, a temple, template within Protocol Builder and then give it to somebody else, clone and push. So that's what I'm talking about there. And depending on what you have in questions and stuff, we'll answer your questions and any needs you have. So that was the plan for today. Does this uh, make sense to you guys? Or would you rather have a discussion of climate change? <laughs> protocol builder? Okay, I see you both protocol builder. Okay, so we'll go there. Okay, there we go. All right, so as I mentioned, uh, protocol builder, you know, is a application, a cloud-based application that uh, we created actually in 2015. And it's basically, as I mentioned, a kind of a templated system or like, this, like a TurboTax-like system to enter in all the data for your protocol uh, and then creates the protocol for you. But it also, while it's doing that, allows you to collaborate heavily. And it also allows you to uh, track, you know, all changes and have a really good idea of everything that's going on. And you very easily see the changes you're making. So right now, Protocol Builder comes with uh, these 19 templates built in. Uh, the idea here is to make it so that we're covering the wide variety of needs. So we have, you know, your, your retrospective chart reviews. You know, we have your observational retrospective and prospectives, which a lot of people use. 
And by the way, the chart review, uh, we're going to talk about more, but was, uh, is our newest protocol, um, has the most guidance we've ever put in protocols. We're really adding a lot more guidance for them. And is particularly useful for your residents, fellows, and any other new investigators, maybe research nurses and such, that you know you really have had a hard time getting a quality protocol from. Now again, this is not their, anybody's fault. I mean, which curriculums these days at a major medical school or whatever teach about how to do right protocols and this kind of work? I don't know if it's zero, but it's pretty close. Um, people aren't teaching this stuff. So what happens is you basically, you know, when you're a resident, you just have to either get your program director to walk you through it or some support group who's, you know, basically tasked to do it. Um, we're going to show you that one of the benefits of Protocol Builder, if you're into that realm, is we actually have a whole slew of special support for residents, fellows, and other new investigators that just makes everybody's life easier. So we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more. So here are the 19, and by the way, we have a, a repository. You can have the separate or, or part of it, so that's how the whole the 19 add up. Uh, it is interesting that the, the recent one we also added was a social behavioral. So if you have your psychologists, social workers, those kind of folks, you know, they don't like the clinical language in some of the templates, this is not much nicer for them. Okay, so this should cover most people's needs. One of the beauties of protocol filler is it's all given to you. If we, if we add in, you know, another new protocol and we're, you know, we're always listening to people for what we might do, uh, people have said maybe you should do a QA, QI protocol, something like that. It'll be part of the subscription, uh, which is one of the nice things. All right. So what I wanted to do is try and help you understand how to use this tool that is so nicely supplied by your CTSI. So what, the way we're going to do that, so I want to make you understand so you know every step of the way. So basically what we're doing is we're starting at the CTSI uh, core page, uh, and we're at the, res uh, we're at the, you know, the tools, the research tools. Okay. So that would be the first step. Then what you can do, when you go down that page, you will see, and I know you guys in the phone can't see where I'm pointing, but it says, how do I access this resource? And there is a place where you can click. And that will bring up a screen that will basically either give you the ability to sign up or, sign, or, or just sign in. Uh, and one of the nice things is we have what's called single sign-on. So when you, you're logging right into the system using your existing um, username and which password? Your institutional password. Your institutional password. And by the way, that's a really useful thing to know because this is a cloud product, right? So some of times we actually work outside the office, right? Maybe all of us. So when we do that, you don't have to, if you, if you can't access the system remotely, which I don't know how difficult it is when you're on the road, you could just use that your username and password for, for here and go to protocolbuilderpro.com and just log in there. So if that's ever an issue for you, you know, that's a way to get around that. So you don't need to be here. And you also make one clarification. We don't quite have the simple sign-on. It's something that's under consideration. Oh, sorry, sorry. No, no, it's okay. Um, but when you do register for protocol, you can actually um, create your own password. So we use our email address. It has to be a children's national or cnmc.org or any email address related to children's national. And then you can use whatever password convention you like should be able to log in with that. And, uh, and a note on that, so that works for everybody who is, you know, children's national emails. Now, what happens if you have somebody like right now at George Washington that you're working on a protocol with? Or somebody at, let's pick a, you know, try and pick a school. It's hard to find that don't use this right now. I'm kidding. Wish, wish it was that easy. But, uh, you know, some other institution that's not using protocol builders. You can actually sign them up under the uh, Children's National subscription because they're needed for the, for the uh, research. And what you do then is you can't use that sign-in page. What you need to do is either go to Jaren, who can sign you up, or send an email to me. So, you know, we can, we can take care of it. So if you have that situation, not a problem, okay? All right. Um, Oh, and by the way, if it happens to be a person who is a, uh, already a Protocol Builder subscriber, like, you know, NYU, that you're doing your research with, you can actually just type in their email address. You'll see when we get to it when you want to add people to your, you know, to your cover list, and it'll find them and put them right in. So that's another benefit. So it's just a very easy product to collaborate with, which is one of the big benefits. All right, so now we'll go ahead and uh, – you know, only the next morning, right? Um, that's fine. OK, 
Okay. Seem to have lost part of my presentation. So hold on a sec. So let me go to plan B. Okay, so we have the help. 
we also um, we do um, we do these trainings. Okay, uh, every new account, uh, and then cases like this where we're coming back to one of our good accounts, we try and do these private trainings that are uh, more focused on your specific needs. Like, for example, exactly how do I get there in our screen? So, um, so we have these trainings, and by the way, this is being recorded, and it'll be available for you guys to review. So, or, or your your, uh, your colleagues, you know what I mean? So one of the nice things about Protocol Builder is, for example, one of our good customers is NYU, and they're basically adding a new person every day. It's about the average, maybe even more. So, you know, the thing is, well, how do I train and support these people? You know what I mean? They didn't all come on when I started the, the thing, right? So we, of course, had the recorded training we did for them, and we've done steps, you know what I mean? So people, we have these trainings online here. So these trainings here can be downloaded at any time. And the first one is more of like the training I'm going to be doing today, which is more of an overall training. The other one deals with specific topics. You know, dealing with, you'll hear me, see me talk about them, but references, the compare revision feature, you know, how to do that clone and push technique. So, you know, we're trying to give you guys tools. So if it is Sunday at 2 a.m. and you're working, sorry, but if you are, if you want to be, there's even ways to learn and help you then. So that's basically the goal. Now there's also, we do uh, regular trainings uh, for the world too that are live. I do them. Uh, they're usually, uh, they're, we do it one introductory a month and one uh, advanced a month. You're welcome to that. We basically, uh, you know, advertise on our website, Duran knows, and other folks know. So if you need that kind of training and want to attend one, feel free. We also have a take a tour, which is kind of a screen by screen uh, training on it. Uh, we have a user guide, which is your more in depth technical or textual stuff. But you're going to see that a lot of what's in the user guide and stuff is actually in our tool tips that are right where you need them, right in the product. And then we have these FAQs, which are technical FAQs. They're not uh, marketing FAQs. And uh, fortunately, it's not a very long page because we don't have a lot of problems. But, but again, you know, things come up. Sometimes people have problems, you know, when, they're out, when they do their output and they're getting weird characters. And, you know, it turns out they, you know, cut and paste from Word and they didn't turn off track changes and, you know, that put in some, you know, hidden characters that, you know, basically protocol builder misinterpreted. So, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, we have that stuff written there for you so that, again, you can get help and, and know what's going on right away. So that's on the help stuff. So up on the tool ribbon, there's a couple other things I think I'll show you. One is the, uh, I'm going to show you the resource center. So the resource center is, basically has different kinds of links that you will probably, might find useful in the, in the writing of protocols and, and basically doing, a, you know, uh, research. And we're, what we're doing here is, first of all, the first section is talks about the new resident and a new investigator program stuff I was telling you about. And by the way, some of this stuff is not even, you know, protocol builder specific. So, for example, the um, observational research design training is not in protocol builder. Okay, this is a broader piece to help you. So a lot of the purpose of this program that we've created, this resident investigator program, is actually designed to help you create the curriculum, if you, call, if you want to call it such, that you're going to help train your residents and fellows how to do this project and hopefully even more, maybe how to do research, you know, which uh, I think a lot of them might appreciate. So uh, this can be a real benefit. One of the beauties of this program is it's part of the subscription protocol builder. You guys are allowed to use any of this content and any material you want. You don't have to worry about copyright or anything like that. So if you need to create a presentation or something, you know, for a resident group or something, use our stuff. It's, it, you're, you're, you know, well used. So we also have links to other things like, um, because one of the ideas with this section is to make it so people don't have to run all over the internet to find the things they need, especially make, trying to make sure that they're current. That's one of the big problems out there. You know, sometimes you go pull an FDA form and then you pull it off a mystical university site. Just turns out that mystical university didn't update their site. You know what I mean? You just grab the first one and so it's the wrong, it's not really the right form. So that causes you a problem. So again, we're trying to make life easier for everybody. And so we have a lot of other things. We have like links to clinical trials like Gov's uh, glossaries we're going to take a look at. You know, we have uh, got links to the NIH stuff. We've got links to, you know, the FDA forms and other forms that you might need. So these are all part of the resource center and it's just a useful tool for you guys. All right, let's talk a little bit about protocol building protocols. 
So we can go ahead and start a new protocol from here. We can also start from within the file area. And then we just click on this right here. We can go ahead and now we have our setup. So I'm going to go ahead and say CN and we're going to go ahead and put a principal investigator in, which is me. I'm going to go ahead and use my stage name, which is Carl Sagan with a K. And I can go ahead and just choose the protocol type I want. So I can go here and just pick the one that I want. Now, if I didn't know which one I wanted, I'm you know, a little unsure. I can use a wizard that we have that will help uh, figure out um, that can I not be correct? <laughs> That's weird. Okay. So I can go ahead and choose this wizard. And it's going to basically walk us through the steps. So it start out, okay, do I need a repository? So yes. You know, is this repository, you know, the center of the, you know, the focus of the study? No. You know, and as we go through these decision tree questions, it's just going to keep asking us things until we you know, get to the point. So I'll say it's an interventional uh, one. Okay, so we'll say it's a device. Okay, significant risk, non-significant risk. Okay, we'll go ahead and we'll say it's non-significant risk as well. We'll say it's significant risk, why not? And then based on that, it's saying we have an interventional significant risk device with repository. Okay, so now if that's not really what I wanted, you know, let's say I didn't have a repository or, or I want to make a complete different change. I can go ahead and change it. And then by hitting the save below, it'll make it'll actually change. It's over here in the left is the table of contents. So just to give you some real uh, change in the table of contents, you can uh, see the change occurring. So I'm going to go ahead and change that to a social behavioral protocol and hit the return. And then you're going to notice that the, you know, the actual team table of contents has changed fairly dramatically. But I want to tell you one, one really nice thing about protocol builder is that you're going to see more commonality between all your protocols. Um, and that this is especially useful, let's say, the IRB. Like you're going to see a lot more similarity between an observational retrospective and a combi you know, an interventional combo uh, with protocol builder than you probably see between two observational retrospectives done separately. <laughs> it's one of those things you're going to see a lot of commonality, which just makes it a lot easier to review and go through. All right, so we we come into the uh, we're in this page here, so we're in the cover page. Now the cover page does cover pagey kind of things, right? So we put in our study number, and investigational, you know, product, and IND number, and, I, and all that kind of stuff. And then um, we go ahead and we put in our collaborators. Now these collaborators are not just the people who are going to list on the cover page. I mean, that is what it'll do. But this, more importantly, it's going to set these people up as collaborators on this uh, project, on this study, on this protocol. And what you're going to see is that we have a lot of really nice collaboration tools. I think you're going to see they're far, far stronger than, you know, Word or Google Docs uh, for helping you write protocols and do revisions on protocols and see key changes in protocols than, than what you're doing now. So basically, uh, what we can do is, uh, first of all, we can add a principal. You know, we have principals, we have investigators, sponsors, medical monitors, key study personnel, you know, like biostatisticians, and then research administration. Research administration is on its own section because um, the, the tradition most of the time is that research administration is not listed on the cover page of a protocol. Now, if a research admin person is supposed to be on the cover page, then they should use the uh, key study personnel field instead. Okay, again, this was a request from the, from the world for us, so we, we did it the way they asked us to. Okay, so um, what happens is if I want to add somebody, uh, I was going to go ahead, I'm going to add, uh, first of all, if I want to add another principal, and this is a general overall tool in Protocol Builder, you hit the circle and plus key to add like something else, like another principal investigator, another appendix. Uh, you'll see this in other places, so that's the way Protocol Builder works. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put in uh, one of my other investigators to work with. I'm going to work with Malcolm Wolberg. 
don't know if you know this, but he's also a serious investigator after he's not doing his hamburgers and all that kind of thing. So, um, so we have him in here, and then we would pick his role. Uh, normally, the two roles that we would pick would be either writer or reviewer. Writer gives you full writing access to the protocols, including adding people to the protocol uh, contact list. Okay. A reviewer can only look at the sections and can only send messages versus one means, which I'll show you later, but can't do anything else. Okay. Um, and you know, basically, and then there's one other rule we have, which is none. None is primarily for VIPs that get their name on protocols that don't actually look them. Um, so that's what it's there for. Um, so uh, normally, you would, you know, you normally you're going to give a lot of people writer roles, but you do need to think about that because if you give somebody a writer role, like a biostatistician or whatever. They can add people to the study, which means they can add people that you don't know of as principal investigator to see your study. Um, so again, I, you know, if you're doing an observational retrospective as a resident, I doubt that's a big issue. But if you're working on the, you know, the next drug to cure cancer, you know what I mean? You probably don't want people just sending your work out to people you don't know. Um, so again, if you're, you know, if that's the situation, you might want to choose the reviewer role for that person. You can always change the role at another time if you choose to do that. Okay. Right. So that's how we basically do it. And when we want to enter somebody in, as I, you probably saw me do, you just basically um, uh, you um, click on the field uh, that you want to do. You, if you start typing in a name, uh, start, let's say you type in a name that recognizes it. So like if I type in, you know. It knows that, um, well, first of all, I have to spell it right. So it knows that I have some Brian's that I work with that I've worked with before and it'll let me quick pick them, so that's nice. But if it's not finding it that way, what you can do is you can go ahead and then search the database and you type in their email. So I could pick, you know, an email search for it, and if it finds it, which like it did in this case, because this person, which is also me, is in the system, and so therefore it's great. It's going to let me add me, submit it, and let me add me to the study. Now, if, I, if it didn't recognize that name, it'll give me the opportunity to add them to our account. Okay, so again, if this was somebody who just either had, you know, like some, from another school or something like that, you can add them. This is one way you can add them, so that you can include them in your study. Now, once we've added our people, um, what we need to do is we need to save the changes. And that's an important uh, reality about Protocol Builder. Whenever you're in a section, you have to save the section, otherwise it will abandon. And it does that on purpose, uh, because uh, especially when you're in some of the writing sections, because everything that's saved is saved into the audit log. You may choose just not to save something. You just may not want it in there. So, you know, if you choose not to save something, it's going to be abandoned. So you'll see that you can always uh, save, and, uh, and that's what you should do. So I'm not going to save it because I don't really need this. I'm going to go ahead and pull up a, uh, an existing protocol with some content in it because it's actually easier to show you the functions protocol but with some content already in. All right, so now I've basically uh, launched a protocol with the, you know, with the, uh, that had content in it. And these, this is the first thing I'm getting. So this is our, our dashboards. Uh, these are our dashboards. Uh, the dashboards basically help give you an understanding based on the writer's input of kind of where we are in this protocol. And it helps you understand, you know, reasonably, like one of the big uses of this is to kind of see, you know, as a protocol. People are somebody telling you a protocol is done. Let's say you're research administration, you're allowed to see the system. If you're on the system, they're telling you it's done, but then you come to the protocol and you see, you know, big old empty spots. And uh, that might say to yourself, well, geez, I don't know if I really want to spend an hour reviewing this protocol when I know it's missing stuff. Maybe what I'll do instead is send them a note back, give you the protocol builder saying, hey, maybe you should finish up these parts, and then I'll take a look at it. Or whatever nice way you have to say this. Thing. So, again, this is all designed to help you. It's also like, let's say, help a principal get a good idea of where they are, you know, that kind of stuff. Now, now I'm going to show you one of the menu. The menu on the lower left does just one thing. 
about ease of use. Brings up the table of contents as well as the needs review button, which we'll talk about a little later. So now on the left, very left, you're seeing some uh, you're seeing some signs here that are giving you an indication of how far that particular section has been done. A green circle and check means that that section has been marked as complete. So okay, now whenever you see a plus on the right, means that this is a section head. Okay, so you're going to see subsections below it. On the subsections, a subsection with a green circle and check means that it's been done and marked by the by the writers as complete. Okay. If you see a gray circle and check, it means that section's been entered into and the writers have marked that as a draft. If you see a line like this where there's no nothing, it's just a gray line, that means this section has not been touched. So it's just an easy way for people to understand, okay, where am I in the process? Okay. These are all helping you understand where we really are. Okay. So now I'm going to go ahead and let's go ahead and start doing a little bit of uh, actual editing. Before I do that, are there any questions as I've been going through all this? Okay. So, I'm sorry, so yeah. external collaborators uh, outside of the system here enter the system the same way? So that through the CTSI website? No. They would probably enter through the, uh, I mean, they probably click on that button because you still get a screen, but I mean, you, they could also probably more easily do it through uh, protocolbuilder.com. Upper right hand corner says login. And you, you said that when we add, you can add external collaborators to that last screen, so they're automatically registered and can go immediately through Protocol Builder into that system? They get a welcome email first. They have to set up a password for themselves. Right. Well, I'm just saying that's the steps, and then so they see that they get the welcome email, and then they're into Protocol Builder, and they come in. Not that this makes a difference, but they'll come in under the Children's National Account. Again, they may not notice. Uh, they might come up in a couple of places, like for example, it might show up. You know, cause it is the Children's National Account, but uh, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And by the way, it's encouraged, as I said. Uh, you know, it's an unlimited user, unlimited protocol subscription. You're not costing the group anymore. You know, whatever. And, you know, we want you to get your settings done the way you want. And if you ever have a problem getting somebody in, Duran or myself will take care of it, make sure it's done. So if somebody's having a problem getting in or you know, having a problem signing somebody up, just let me know and we'll take care of it. The main thing to remember is that they can't sign themselves up through the link on the, the screen because they won't have the right email suffix. It's going to look for the email suffix just on that one screen, on the Children's National screen. It's going to look for, but we can enter anybody else in separately. Uh, questions? Uh, also, you only need to go through the CFI website for initial access to the platform. Once you do that, you can go to protocol.com slash login. And once you have your username and password, you can go right in. So, yeah, thank you very much. But, you know, one of your templates is an NIH phase two, phase three study, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a little confused on that because I thought that. I've written a clinical trial application for NIAID and another one for NANDS, and those protocols don't look the same. Those templates that I've sent from the institutes don't look the same. So is this tool meant for use for IRB and not for direct submission to the NIH, or is it institute tailored? Well, I mean, it's designed for the IRB. The, the, that phase two, phase three, that is the NIH grant. Uh, protocol that's similar to what they have on their website that you need to fill out um, to to qualify for their grant. Again, I don't know all the steps in their process because I don't do that. I don't know what else you're supposed to do. I mean, you know what I mean? There's there's, I, I'm sure, there's things you have to do, I assume, besides having this protocol. But the protocol that is produced by Protocol Builder is the one that they accept for their uh, grants, for that specific grant. Okay. Does that make sense? I, I, I'm not sure. So you might be talking about a different NIH. I'm not sure if you are or you're not, because that, that particular one is a very specific grant that they give to that phase. Do you know, Peter? I mean, I, no, it's going to be the 424. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and there's lots of variation. How do you do that? Right. And that, that's what. Okay. Well, again, and if I'm missing 
something? Because, you know, uh, please take a look at it. If you, I mean, I've had nobody give us negative feedback. So, I mean, that's why, but I want to know. I mean, if there's a pro, if you see something different when you look at that protocol for what it is and it doesn't seem to be doing what it's supposed to do, please let us know. Uh, we actually went, uh, just so you know, uh, in fact, I'm going to NIH tomorrow to their CTSI, but um, when we, when they created their new version of the protocol, which they did, I think, last year, we had it change on our system within 24 hours. I mean, we, we take it that seriously, so I definitely want to know if there's if something's wrong. Um, so I hope that answers your question. It did partially, and we'll really do more research to get you more better answers than that. Okay, good question. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and, and start talking about editing. Before I do that, I'm going to talk about one of our collaboration features. Um, this little bubble here is basically the message window. And the message window is kind of a chat window that's associated with every subtopic of protocol builder. So the nice thing here is then that on this subtopic, I come up number of participants, you know, I can be writing notes to, to, you know, to the group or to whoever's on here to, uh, you know, let them know what's on my mind. Now, what's nice about using it in protocol builders versus using it in, let's say, email or some other chat system you might have, is that, uh, you know, let's say we were talking about statistical methods, you know, that we wanted to use. You know, now it's, uh, you know, protocols can, lack, can affect years down the road, right? Now it's two years later, you know what I mean? And, and we're looking at our results and we're saying, didn't we talk about some different statistical methods and what that might cause, you know what I mean? So if you do it in the notes in protocol builder here, the protocol builder notes stay with the protocol builder file forever. They don't get printed out in protocol, but they're in the protocol builder file in the subsection. So it's like, oh, yeah, I remember this now. I remember this conversation we had. You know, I mean, it's, it's just a very useful tool that way because you know where it's going to be. And you know it's that subsection. So you're not trying to search through emails that you may not find. You're not using a Yahoo chat, which probably may not exist by the time you, you, know, you actually use it, you know, that kind of thing. So that's why it's nice to use uh, the feature in protocol builder. All right, and then you can see how many messages are in this particular subsection, which is this number right here. So, okay, so this red eye, remember I was telling you about the tool tips. So the tool tips are basically guidance. And we're spending, uh, we're going to be spending a lot of time over the next few years adding to the guidance because that's been one of the greatest requests. People have asked for more guidance. And as a matter of fact, for some fields, and I don't think number of participants is one of them, we've actually created a sample text. And sample text just means that we've try to say, you know, structure the sentences that would be put in there, you know what I mean, and then with room for data to be popped in there um, so that they get the right thing done. And it, it's all about trying to make this easier for the writers. Uh, there's a lot of writers that have a hard time just verbalizing what the basics, you know, what they're trying to get across. So we're trying to help in every way possible. So I'm now in the editing mode, and being in the editing mode, you'll notice uh, that this basically looks like a Microsoft Word knockoff box, because it does. We're trying, you know, people tend to know Word, so we're trying to make it easier for people by making much of what we do, things they've already seen. Now what we did do, though, is we've added some functions that uh, really Word and Google Docs don't do that well. Uh, one of them is just bringing in scientific symbols. You know, they make it more difficult. You know, protocol builder makes it super easy. So this is just another nice, simple tool. Um, we can, uh, let's say, one of the things we want to do is we want to create, you know, a, a, a abbreviation for immune suppression. Okay. So we can go ahead to do that. Is we just highlight the abbreviated letters. We choose the abbreviation tool, and then we just type in. Type it, save it, and now it's going to be there when we fly over it. We're going to see the term, and it's going to be put into our abbreviation section. Okay. So one of the really nice things about Protocol Builder is it's going to build out your your reference section, your abbreviations, your appendices, your glossary, your list of tables. All this stuff's going to be done from what you enter into the subsections. You're not going to have to do this at the end. Uh, and it's going to do all the numbering for you and the formatting junk and all that stuff is generally not a lot of fun. One caveat on all that uh, gives me a chance to talk about the saving. So as I mentioned earlier, if you don't save a section, if you just like move away from it, it's going to abandon your work, okay, because it's going to assume that was your choice. 
And people do that, as I mentioned earlier, because you might start something that you just don't like and you don't want it as part of the audit log, you know, and that's why we do that. Um, so we can save as draft or save as complete. And this is basically just trying to mimic the current thing, you know, way we work today and how we try to make a protocol work. Now, if I save as complete, it doesn't lock it down for life or anything like that. This is really just helping us try to understand as writers where we think we are in this process. So if we mark it as complete, then we can go back and edit it more and mark that as complete. Or we can go back and make it back to a draft or any of these kinds of things. It's, it's really, and it's really the last writer in is the one that's making this mark. Right? So if you have five people in here, you know, one of them thinks it's complete, the others think it's not, well, you know, then they can all be changed. So, you know, again, the idea here is though is these choices help, you know, get these, you know, circles and checks and the, you know, the numbers and the, you know, and the dashboards, all this kind of stuff. And just trying to help people understand where you are and just realize that Word and Google Docs don't help you at all in this realm, really. You know, you're really, really much, much harder to see what's been, you know, still open to do and where we are on it. So that is the benefit. So we've created our immune suppression thing. Now we can also create, um, you know, glossary terms. So if I want to, you know, basically pick a term that I want to, uh, you know, create a glossary term out of, you know, I just choose it. Now I can choose just to um, uh, to go ahead and uh, create the glossary term by choosing the glossary, and I can just type it in. But, you know, one of the choices, I'm not going to go back on the menu, but remember I had, we have a link in our links to clinicaltrials.gov glossary. Okay, well, let's do that. You know, again, we don't have to reinvent the wheel, you know, so we can go ahead and, uh, by the way, this is not the correct definition, I know. Let's do it stuff. And then we can go ahead and pick it, and then uh, when I pick the, um, Glossary again, glossary again, there it is. I can go ahead and type it in and go save, and now it's done. And by the way, you're going to see, as long as I save the section, you can fly over it now and see the definition, and this definition will be in the glossary section. Okay. The next tool I'm going to show you about is one of the ones that people tend to really get a kick out of, and that's how we handle references. Now, we can go ahead and really just do a new reference on the fly, not a problem. Here's our stuff, just go ahead, enter it in, and as I say at the end of the document, the product's gonna you know, do all the work for you, create your reference section number and all that. But, um, normally, when you're actually at the point where you're creating a protocol, you probably have the vast majority, if not all of your references already in hand, right? at that part of the study. So you should know what you're referring to by that point, you would think. So, um, so one of the things about Protocol Builder is we actually give you the means to bring uh, in your references that you've taken from other sources, places like you know, PubMed or, or going to your EndNote or I use Zotero because it's free and I'm cheap, you know, that kind of thing. And you can, uh, you know, you just use that and bring it right into Protocol Builder and then let Protocol Builder do the formatting for you and all that kind of stuff uh, rather than doing it yourself. So that, let me quickly, you know, show you what we do is we can go to, you know, any, any, you know, of our normal sites. I'm going to do PubMed and it's just easier. And, uh, you know, I can go ahead and pick, you know, There are abscesses, and I can go ahead and and now as a real researcher, you know what I mean. I can what I probably do is I mark off these things and I pick the ones that I'm going to use, you know, that I'm using, and then uh, I've already marked them, and then I would go ahead and I can bring them, get ready to bring them to Protocol Builder by using the send to function in PubMed. Pick the citation manager, which basically creates an MBIB file for ourselves, and we would go ahead and save this. Um, to our um, to our file, you got to you know you want to pick a location and you know place you can remember, because otherwise it's like can be less fun. And we would say this, and then what I can do is I can go into Protocol Builder and I can just bring it right in. So to bring in a Protocol Builder references, I use up in the tool. And I go over to uh, the pro profile choice, and in one of the few cases where we have a sub menu, 
you pick the references submenu here. And what you do is you basically choose the file from your file work that you want. Okay, so I'm going to go over to my, uh, my references. And I'm going to pick the one I just made. And I'm going to upload it. And there we go. My reference has been put into my reference uh, repository over here. And, and so now, what I do is if I go back to my uh, actual work, okay, if I want to use that reference, I go ahead and I just pick where I want that reference, add the reference. Now I just find it in my repository. Now, if I have a lot of them, I can use search terms so that I can narrow it down. Okay. So, um, you know, and then I would just pick the one up. I want to look at how that particular, uh, you know, particular reference was set up. I can take a quick look at it, and then I can go ahead and insert it. And now I can insert it. Well, I can, if I want to look at that reference or edit it, I can go ahead and change it and take a look here and see exactly what I have. Do we have a question? What format should you import this There are two formats that are acceptable. MVIB, which is the, the um, uh, you know, the PubMed, thank you, the PubMed format, and the other is RIS, which is the format that is put out by EndNote, Zortero, and just about everybody else in the world. So, so you can uh, export all your, all your files from uh, Zortero? And, and the one that I like this, you can put your 2000 in and just pick from it. Right. The only thing you can't do is you can't put in a, a million of them. <laughs> no, no, really. We have to do it. Not, not a million, but I mean, there, there are some limits. I mean, as far as just size, you know, somebody tried to import this massive, massive, massive list. Which probably is not, I mean, it's not bad. What they should have done is broken into pieces. <laughs> or, I mean, they didn't know. Well, you can do that in those programs. Right, right, right. So I'm just saying. So that's the only limit, yes. But you can bring them all in. And, and the beauty is it's not just for this protocol. Once you bring a reference in, it's in, and this is your particular reference file for Protocol Builder. Because, again, many times you're going to use the same references over and over again, so you don't need to. And then one of the things it will do, by the way, is I can choose to clone this. So by cloning it, then I can actually write in, let's say now I can write in the page number and stuff that's more specific to this one. So maybe this reference is in general, but this particular reference is just page one, you know, page 14, <laughs> you know, line seven, you know, any kind of thing. So you can create a, a clone of it and then save it so you're not ruining the original, you know what I mean? If you, you know what I mean? So you can keep the, the blank that you would use most of the time and, and then use the other one. So, okay. So, uh, that's how some of the references work, okay? So, um, and then uh, we also have the ability to do footnotes, which is page notes, really, really straightforward, no problem. And then we do have the ability to bring in tables. And basically tables uh, are any kind of, it could be a Microsoft chart, a you know, Microsoft spreadsheet, JPEG, GIF, all this kind of stuff. And you can go ahead and bring it right into our, um, you know, right in into our, uh, uh, piece here, like it's going to hopefully do. Do it, I don't know why. Some more. And it'll just bring it right on in. So, and then the other thing we can do, by the way, is um, we can bring in appendices, as I mentioned. Uh, you know, that can be, you know, important because sometimes you don't want to, uh, you know, have all this stuff in your document. So you can bring as many as you want. And by the way, this plus key can add as many as you want. All right, so now we've done a lot of the editing. Let's take a, let's take a look at the output uh, because obviously that's the whole point of this, right? And again, I want to make the point that Protocol Builder makes vanilla, you know, uh, Word document files of your protocol that you you know you can use and turn into the IRB through the normal means. You know, it's not nothing special. You just use the same technique. Choose the file with your IRB IRB submission system, and boom, it's the exceptional one right there. All right, so. Let's talk a little about the output, okay? We have a number of outputs in Protocol Builder that are really useful. By the way, all the output comes in the gear wheel. Again, simplicity, right? Don't have to guess, not all over the product, just one place for output. So when we take a look at the output, when we look preview protocol, the nice uh, feature, because what it lets you do is for the first time now, we're gonna be able to see the protocol as a, as a whole. 
you know, and, you know, that can be very, very useful. So we've been working on this thing in subsections, right? But as in many things, sometimes when you take a look at how things are running smoothly, you're finding that it's not exactly the way you want it, okay? Now, probably now what you're doing is you're putting the new one on screen, you probably have the old version on the side of the piece of paper, and you're running pages like this, right? You're, you're, you're eyeballing it, you're doing all this kind of stuff. The nice thing about using Protocol Builder for that function is not only can you see that you can see what's you know, different, but now I can go ahead and I can change things right on the fly. So I can go ahead and go right into edit mode right from here. So if I see that this transition between these two statements isn't right, I can just go ahead and make the changes right now. So it's just a nice tool to help you edit, especially for final editing. All right. Um, okay, uh, so we can invite to review. Uh, which is a collaboration feature. By the way, I didn't show you another one earlier when we're, which I should have shown you, which is we can actually, as we're saving a section, we can actually ask our collaborators to say, send them a note saying, hey, can you take a look at this section I just fixed, you know what I mean, or just changed? And it'll send them an email with a link that'll take them right to it. Okay, so that's kind of a nice feature. So I can actually pick people I want to send uh, to say, look, I need you to review this, and you know, I'd like you to, and you can put a message and go ahead and submit that right there. We also, another kind of output is we can go ahead and uh, send by email. So this is the first way of sending something outside a protocol builder, and we can put in whatever emails we want with whatever message, and it sends them a PDF of the current version of the product. So if there's somebody you're collaborating with or you, for some reason, not using Protocol Builder or something or whatever, that's what you can do and send them a piece of where we are right now. We can also... Can, can you get it to send a, a, a Word version as well? Yes. And I was going to show you that. Be PDF. Well, no. It doesn't have to be PDF. No. When you use that one function, it's a PDF, it's not a PDF function, but I'm going to show you now a way to get a Word file that you can send as a draft. I'm just going to show that to you. So if so that was set up for PDF. So with Word, okay, so now I can create a Word or a PDF file on the fly at any time. So if I wanted to do what you were doing, I didn't want to send a, a, PDF, or a PDF as that shareable document, I would just create my Word file, you know, save it, and then email it or whatever I want to do with it, uh, and it's going to be the most current version, okay? Now, I want to show you really quickly, in our reign of our time, uh, first of all, I want to show you the, um, Compare revisions function, which is a really strong function. So here is a compare revisions function. And what it does is on the left, we have the last um, completed version or the last draft, depending, say draft, depending on whether it's a completed version or not. And what's happening here is you should be seeing in a very, very visual, clear way what has been changed. You see what's added in green, what's subtracted in red. You know, things like this, if, if this, if this uh, chart was new, it would be like this chart surrounded in green, you know, a green number of the reference subject to new reference. So it's giving you a very easy, visceral way to see what's been changed in sections. And by the way, we have to say, we actually also offer a summary of changes for the whole protocol, which is very, I think I showed it to you briefly, maybe uh, that lets you see very, very easily what's been changed. So, well, if you're at the IRB or whatever, you can hex, you know, go through and look for all the changes within the document, or you just go to the end, see the changes, and go make my life that much easier. So that's one of the functions. So this is the compare revisions, and you can actually choose any version that you've ever had and bring that back up for comparison. And you can even make that older version the most current version. Why would I do that? Maybe it's already on a new approach and it just isn't working. You know, we have a meeting coming up, you know, in two days, and, and you know, for this meeting, I don't want to deal with this new stuff. You know, I mean, I want it back the old way for the meeting. But by the way, it's because it's saved as your draft I've ever made, I can go back and I can pick that earlier draft that I started work on and continue work on it later to get it where I want it. So it's just a nice way to be able to work and edit. And by the way, you're probably noticing here, this is that where I didn't show you, but when you, when you create one of these, uh, when you uh, send out a uh, note to people, uh, you know, when you want to look at a section, you can actually put in the notes, and the notes will show up right here. We also have an audit log, which is the revision log. The nice thing about the audit log is it's uh, non-editable. Okay, you can't change it. That was an issue for some people. Uh, and um, so it's going to be a real audit log. And you can also use it to use the compare function or you can you know, create it as a new draft. So you can actually always see. And the coloring, the green tells you it was saved as complete and the yellow is that it was saved in um, 
draft. And then we have the needs review section, which I mentioned a little earlier. And this just shows you all the things that people have asked you to do on this protocol. So, you know, you got, so let's say we have a normal thing, you know, we've got like seven team members, you know what I mean? And these people are sending me different things. I can actually go through the list, they have the one they sent it to me, take a look at it, do my edits. It's just a nice way to make sure that you're actually getting, you know, getting things done. All right, so um, one of the things I want to make sure I do is show you how would I, how would I have a protocol ready to turn into the, uh, to the IRB. <laughs> So if I, if I go ahead and I, uh, let's just go into edit here. All right, so I've shown you how to create a, a draft at any time, right? I should have to create a PDF or a to word it. How do I get it in for submission? How do I have to be sure it's ready? Okay, so one of the things I want to do is I show you up here in the protocol section, file cabinet, I, as I mentioned. do is we're going to be able to see the version of this particular protocol where it is. I don't know why it's taking this long, but what you probably remember seeing, hopefully, is when you saw the titles, you also saw the version, right? If the version is draft, no idea what it's doing here. If the version is draft, um, that means it's version one, and that means that that protocol has not gone through all the steps to mark it as complete. Okay, finally. Okay, so here it is, draft. Okay, that means version one. Now, version two means that I'm going to go through the steps that I'm going to show you in a second to actually thin arch off the protocol. So, if I actually go into my protocol and I go into the um, the menu and I pick this uh, and I pick the checklist. So, to complete a protocol, what I need to do is I need to have green circles and checks for all of the num these sections, synopsis through seven, okay? And then what I need to do is I go through this checklist, which is just trying to make sure that I'm actually really doing, you know, completing this protocol. It's all about helping you make sure you're compliant. And then I can press a version. So it'll go from draft, and then you'll see it in this version two, and that version two means it's basically been done. So maybe that version two is the one now that I've done it, I create a Word file out of it now, and I send it off to the IRB. Okay, say the IRB now takes a look at it and it comes back with these five issues, okay? So now what I would do is I would call up out of the list, version two, you know, the name of my protocol, version two, and I would do the changes I need to do. Then I would do that whole final part again, the checklist again, you know, making sure that green circles and checks, because quicker this time, right? Some of it probably aren't changing. And then I make sure I go through the checklist, and then I hit the published version, and now it's gonna create version three. Okay, and um, what's next? And maybe that will be the one I resubmit to the um, to the uh, uh, IRB. Now, one of the really nice things, as I mentioned earlier, is that we do create. Uh, not only do we create super pretty protocols, but one of the beauties of it is is that we um, actually can see our summary of changes. Where's my Um, we can actually see very, very clearly what changes were made. And if we chose to put in actual in the rationale, which the rationale goes over here for what we changed. So when you use the summary of changes button on Protocol Builder, which you can only do on versions two and greater, right? Because you can't have a summary of changes if there's never been anything done. So now I can go ahead, I can see my protocol, and I can actually also edit rationales as I make changes. So you can see the changes I've made, and I can put in rationales for my changes if I want to. By the way, you can turn this off. Why would I, and then turn it back on with the information still there? Why would you turn it off? If you're turning this protocol into somebody really important, you know, this is like a really important protocol, you know, maybe the one you're giving to certain people, you don't want to have some of your changes to just look good, you know what I mean? And that's the reason why you can turn it on. Okay, so that is, uh, that's how you get your output, and then as I said, you're, you're saving your protocol to, you know, when you, you save it under Word to whatever name and location that you know, and you just go in your, your IRP submission system, choose it, it's in the system, done. So basically, that's Protocol Builder. Um, I hope I've covered uh, some useful information for you uh, while we have a little time left. Any more questions, comments, answers, insults? 
Well, what's been your experience so far? The reactions from study sessions, from actual submissions, <coughs> people uh, recognizing it in review groups, uh, getting tired of it, uh, expecting something different. What, what, what's been your Well, experience? it's interesting. We, we just actually had a study that was done by Ascension Health. It was actually in the residence section where they were actually comparing work, you know, using protocol builder using work, you know, what, what, what they feel, what was the differences. And the, the bottom line was people were generally a lot happier, a lot happier with protocol builder. But not only in that, when they did the correct, they essentially did the study. Like the completion level was by section, protocol builder, it was 100% across the board. There were other people, it was your typical, you know, varied stuff. Um, so, you know, from that point of view, it's great. From user's point of view, I think they tend to like it. I mean, the problem is, is that most people, most, you know, most people, that's just we're, we're, we're creatures of habit, don't really like doing new things. You know what I mean? We've got enough new things going on. This is a world we've got new things coming out every 10 minutes. So, you know, the idea here is you've got to show them it's going to be a real benefit to them. So I think that investigators tend to, once they get past, you know, okay, I'm going to do this, they see the tool is really helpful because we create for investigators a lot of tools that make it, you know, nice, like the way it does references, and the way it lets you collaborate, you know, much better than Word or, or whatever. You know, an IRB person, you know what I mean? Well, wow, you know, actually now my protocols are more consistent. They actually look more similar and they actually tend to be more complete. And I can even look online if I'm part of the system and even kind of see some stuff that I normally couldn't see or I wouldn't want to look at the Word document too hard to see. You know, um, so, you know, generally I think we've been pretty positive. The hardest thing for people to recognize is number one, it's a new thing and we're the only one doing it, so, you know, it's a new thing. And I think a lot of people sometimes are a little concerned, like they're worried that if I do this, I, how am I going to get it into the IRB submission system? They don't recognize it. Even though this is its own system, it spits out, you know, just a common penny, you know what I mean? So it's really, really easy to use. That, does that seem to answer what yeah. you're how does, it, how does it integrate with our IRB system? We have IRB there. It has its own structure, right? And, and, and uh, it totally doesn't matter because you do it just like you do it today. You go to IRB there, you say, okay, what's the file I want to use to submit for my protocol? You know, you do the same thing. Word that you can't tell uh, that it's from Protocol Builder or Word or you know, written in napkin. You know, it's, it's, uh, it just does it. So it's really invisible, and that's one of the big benefits. We're not adding more kind of work there. Right. Here at our institution, we don't have a version that can actually interact with our there. So one of the first questions we got when we first presented this was, if we fill out information on this protocol, can it automatically be transmitted into our there? And unfortunately, with this version, uh, we don't have that capability. That would involve Brainy having to interact with ClickCommerce, who creates IR Bear, and them having to form a relationship to be able to create those channels. And we don't have that currently. But the great thing is the process is no different than what you would normally do. If you were to write your protocol in Word or use one of the templates that you may share, you would upload it in the very same way. You just simply write the protocol, upload it, the IRB has contingency, yeah. come back into Protocol Builder. Uh, and as we just saw, you can go and it's it's not that the IRB, and it's yeah, almost yeah. virtually the same process that you would have normally. I imagine you still have to fill out some smart form stuff in IR there. You just would upload this to the, that one protocol section. Correct. Yep. Right? So in the fields where you have to respond to the analysts and you have to update the smart forms, you would still have to do that just like you would if you wrote it in Word, uh, basically on your own. Um, but the process is, is virtually identical. We are looking and, and they've considered, we have the ability or the, you know, the raw ability to do this, the programming, and if it may be in the future, that's what we want to do. You know, we can make it smarter. Because one of the nice things about Protocol Builder is all of its fields are our are, are API interface. They're data. So we could connect them, you know, and it's just like anything in life, it just costs money and time. <laughs> so you want to make sure you really need it. Any other, you have a good question? Does, does it allow to have uh, different writers simultaneously working on the same protocol? Or yes, good happen? question. So uh, the answer is absolutely yes with a huge caveat. Okay, um, you can do it except that two writers can, or cannot be working on the same subsection at the same time. Why? Because then you couldn't have an audit log that was accurate. <laughs> right. You know, but, so that's the only caveat. 
so, you know, yes, you can have people working out throughout the product different times, you know, it doesn't matter at all if that's not locked in or anything like that. Question? Great. No, sorry. Um, I think, uh, make sure I understand your question. You mean that Red Protocol Builder would look for similar files? Is that what you're saying? Uh, again, I want to understand your question. Yeah, Protocol Builder doesn't do that. Um, I mean, it's not going to try and look for references that are similar. I mean, like like through the internet. I mean, what you can do is like what I did. If you already imported it, and let's say you have a whole, let's say you have 150 references, you know, and it's hard to find them. Well, you can type in uh, search terms, like I use the word liver or something. So, you know, of the 150 references I have, only five of them have the word liver in it, so it made it a lot quicker. So within the ones I brought in, that's an easy way to do it. But in general, no, protocol built, you're going to, you know, that's what, you know, PubMed and all those other people are for. Uh, we're just trying to help you bring them in once you have them. Uh, the whole social media break right now, we, we have passed the 2 o'clock hour, um, but we do still have some great questions that you're all asking. Um, what I wanted to say was that if you have to depart, uh, we're thankful that you joined our, our uh, protocol builder presentation today. Um, you can always find more information by reaching out to me or reaching out to the Navigator email address. Um, and we're going to actually keep going because we're getting some great questions. And we've also opened the phone lines. So if anybody on the phone has any questions, please feel free to, uh, to unmute. Uh, you're already unmuted. Uh, just feel free to ask them now. And this silence is deafening. I'll be able to cover a few. I love the feature that, that, that I'm organized according to things or information. So you have to reorganize a protocol based on uh, anything, and it might be 10 places in the document in various forms. It would be lovely if we could uh, organize um, in, in, a, in a kind of hidden way uh, that information like that across. Do you know what I'm saying? I think you know what you're saying. You know, again, there's just always a lot of things we can do. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. I, I, I know what you mean. I mean, I get yeah, it's true. It's, it's a true. little hard because I know the way the product is constructed. You know what I mean? I'm trying to think, you know, um, what, because first of all, of course, it is already, you know, in an outline. But you're saying you, you want to have other relationships that you just happen to want to have between sections. Yeah, so, so if we get, oh, we need, we, need to, we need to look at this feature, and we know it's in 10 different places, mm -hmm. it would be nice if we could, uh, more than key word, go wonk. And then all those paragraphs, and we can look at them side by side. Um, I believe Scrivener is good for that program. Uh, definitely that's feature. Oh, okay. No, it's a, uh, yeah, heard of it. Actually. Yeah, it, it's kind of, it's for making um, people use it for writing uh, uh, novels. Uh, yeah. So it's really about pulling ideas. Yeah, yeah, no, I do right. stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll pass it on. I mean, again, the whole point is the structure. <laughs> That's part of what we were trying to bring to this thing. I mean, not that you don't do that. And part of that problem we were facing is people raising their protocols like that, which is in every different way possible. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes that hard. But uh, I'll keep it mind, you know, so it's, kind of fun. it's like all the shows are the same in theory, right? It's kind of been like an invisible thing to be required, and then it pulls up. So, and, um, and the interesting connections are sometimes that way. They're not the ones that are the obvious. But, uh, yeah, it's just if you have to. If you have to